Uh, I'm really um, glad to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Luis Santis. Uh, professor Santis is a professor in um, aerospace engineering and engineering mechanics at UT Austin. Uh, he is also a general dynamics endowed faculty fellow. In Austin, he leads the human-centered robotics laboratory, a lab focusing on control, task and motion planning, human factors and experimentation with humanoid robots, mobile manipulation robots, exoskeletons, and autonomous systems. He was the UT Austin's lead for the DARPA's Robotics Challenge with uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. And he has been awarded the NASA Elite Team Award for his contributions to NASA's Johnson Space Center Software Robotics and Simulation Division. He is also a founding member and innovation advisor for Uptronic Systems, a company focusing on human-centered robotics uh, products. And today his talk is uh, from model-based whole body control to humanoid leg manipulation using ML. And um, please uh, let's give him a round of applause. And thanks for uh, joining us, Luis. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Emil, uh, Yukian, uh, Tianwei, uh, Jan, for this uh, uh, awesome uh, workshop on reactive and predictive humanoid whole body control. The title of my talk was not decided by me, uh, but um, I think it was just right right on uh, on the alley of, of things that um, uh, my lab is involved uh, with. And, um, um, and with that, uh, let's go uh, to the next slide. Uh, and th these are activities that the, the lab that I run, is called the Human-Centered Robotics Lab, uh, is involved in. They all fall in the category of human-centered robotics. And, and here, the, the main positive is always that, uh, you know, all these control algorithms, all of these task and motion planning, all these embodiments, all of these decision-making, they're really to help, help, uh, help humans. So, and although, you know, through my uh, years, I dedicated a lot of time to, you know, real-time control, embodiment, motion planning, and so on, really, the, in more recent times, we're focusing on things like community robotics, um, uh, transportation, uh, people in crowds, uh, the use of human factors to see how people feel about um, all of these combined, obviously, with the embodiment of, of, of things, which are shown here, human or robots, Exoskeletons, these two things, we partner with Haptronic to build those systems. Above is a new mobile base that uh, we've, we are about to launch that looks like cute cute animals, but underneath it has a lot of um, contact sensing and navigation capabilities. And we have some community robotic projects. We have you know dynamic walking and, and, uh, and, and human factors in which we partner with people building uh, leaders here at UT, be building um, sensors for detecting like stress and, um, um, and you know, um, uh, different type of potentials associated with the different reactions, um, mental reactions. Um, another dimension is I put an effort on commercializing over the year. Monolith and the company was founded in 2016. Is now run outside of my uh, purview by my former student and CEO, uh, Jeff Cardenas. I'm still involved in some of the activities, but the company is doing fantastic and some of the incredible um, humanoids you know, developing a lot of products. And I, uh, I really hope that. Uh, it becomes a statement and, and really they, they bring down the prices and they make it affordable and, and they um, contribute to, uh, to all of us to improve our, our, you know, our lifestyles. Um, we had a little bit of, well, a little bit, a lot of sad news because we, uh, we had the, the death of um, uh, a leader uh, in the company, uh, Gerardo Bled, in a few months ago, he was, he was uh, only announced more recently. So um, he was a, a, a true force of nature um, of exactly the topic of this talk on uh, model base, intersectional model base and machine learning uh, with some of the methods he developed on regularized control. 
Um, and those were very, very unique and it allowed um, yet another quantum step in um, in uh, improving walking. Luis? Yes. Hello, sorry. Yes, sorry, Luis. You're sharing the, the wrong screen because we can see your presenter slides. How about this one? Yeah, better. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Okay, so now you can see the right the screen, right? Okay. Yeah, so uh, uh, force of the nature of uh, regularized control and, and it was, you know, very sad news. So, um, but overall, uh, from the positive side, we have been lucky to have him for a while and we thank uh, Gerardo as a, as a company. Um, and, uh, the, you know, I, I want to put an emphasis on, uh, first of all, the, the wealth of model-based um, methods that have been uh, um, developed over the years and have dominated the, um, the progress on, on human robotics. And we'll start from, uh, from the low level. And at the actuator level, we really go into the characterization of everything from the rigid uh, elements to the soft elements. In this case, for instance, a viscoelastic uh, rubber that it, it has very little hy hysteresis. And that goes into our ability of running things like disturbance observers um, to um, impedance controllers, to um, uh, optimization controllers, to uh, full, in particular, uh, when you employ serious elastic actuators, a combination of what we call a full state feedback, being full state, both the position and the force, that if, if it's well used, it can lead to really achieving uh, you know, pretty, high, pretty high bandwidth on the position and pretty high bandwidth on um, um, on the force control as well. So that's one in, one of the types of model-based uh, controls that we see in, in humanoids at a really, really low level. Um, as you may know, uh, the origins of, of my lab and, and, and uh, Usama Khatib, uh, where I did my PhD, was very much in the area of whole body controllers. Whole body controllers are basically trajectory tracking controllers. They're completely model-based. And here are things like EI, which could be thought of as, as the Jacobian. Uh, UI would be the control law. You have a policy, you have some, some least square error minimization. Uh, X could be a combination of uh, force and, and uh, acceleration uh, states. And then you have all sorts of quality constraints and quality constraints, all model-based. And then, you know, there have been a lot of flavors of whole body controllers. Some of them, they have, uh, you know, what is called multi-level optimization or recursive optimization or hierarchical optimization. Some others, they have other forms, um, uh, for instance, um, uh, implicit hierarchical with weights and so on and so forth. So this is another, yet another um, instance of, uh, of model-based control that has dominated uh, humanoids for quite a while, I would say even, even today. Um, now these models need to turn into 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 embodiments, and therefore software architectures are very important. There's been a, a wide variety of of software architectures. As a matter of fact, the IEEE TC on whole body control that um, I'm part of it gives an an, a, a, um, an award on the best whole body control software. This is our flavor. We call it Pi PNC. PNC is for planning and control, and IHWC means implicit hierarchical whole body controller. In this case, we don't use uh, a kind of recursive prioritization. We use weighted prioritization. And there's all sorts of you know, tricks that can make these things work. But often the best thing, the best way to make things work is to, the, to start with some sort of uh, you know, um, uh, heuristics and, and or, or, or sort of principles and the model base, and then start applying heuristics at the empirical level. Because once you, you're thrown into the empirical level, the world looks very different. So everybody has worked on both worlds, has noticed that um, uh, disconnect. And this, in this case, this controller, we call it the, uh, um, we call it the uh, kinodynamic uh, whole body controller, is exactly that um, uh, development of uh, that evolution of starting with a theory and then optimizing um, a combination of modules that work the best in, um, in actual hardware. Uh, kinodynamic inverse kinematics whole body controller allows uh, high precision trajectory tracking for for the feet, for the torso, and so on. But an inverse dynamic controller allows uh, transitions of the contacts that are smooth 
especially if you're walking at relatively high speeds. And it turns out that the family of river controllers, or we just saw uh, Gerardo Paz word on um, regularized controllers, or our own work on um, on time to velocity, uh, time to velocity um, reversal controllers, they all have pretty pretty high frequency of steps, and those need to be handled with a combination of these two uh, type of modules. Um, uh, you know, this has to be coupled with other trajectory generation algorithms. And walking has been largely dominated until very recently by model-based methods. Once again, pendulum methods, um, centroidal methods uh, have greatly dominated the, the, the research uh, market, if you will. Um, if you employ an inverted pendulum model, is uh, it's just a sort of uh, simulating second order system. You have to stabilize it with the position of the feet. And then uh, just a feedback over the state, the state being positions and velocities of the center of mass. This is a, a type of river controller. Our flavor was something we call a time to velocity reversal a policy in which we, um, the, the particular flavor of the feedback is um, is different, has all the robust control um, um, uh, properties. But in particular, you know, all of these controllers are very simple to develop as model base. Once you deploy them in robots, again, is a really hard task, right? And, and in part is because the hardware is involved. So you have to have some level of knowledge of the hardware or a lot of level of knowledge. And if you don't have it, you need to account for these as uncertainty. So here, Q, um, K plus two is, is the second second step um, uh, transition function of the, of the center of mass dynamics. And eta is noise on the position of the feet and delta is noise on the state estimation. And those, we don't know what they are, but they are some value. You can uh, do some contraction theory if you're trying to stabilize the robot balancing. You can bound these as a quadratic function. And then this can be shown that it gives you a convergence to a, an uncertainty ball that is a function of these, of these uncertain parameters. And here on the upper right side, we see that if the error are very large in the state space, you're in this red ball, which means that you would need to really stretch your feet you know, infinitely or really large and very fast, and, and that's not possible. So you normally you live in this strip, in this blue strip um, over here. So if you shrink your uncertainty, this means that you have better controllers, better estimate, estimators, right? And then you are, you're now converging to this little ball, right? So you are not um, as drunk, as, as I call it, right, with these robots as uh, you would be otherwise. Um, now, uh, all of this has to be coupled together with building better robots. And um, one thing, you know, companies that have a lot of money, they can do a lot of things, but laboratories um, like mine, for instance, what I see often is that we, we build a robot. Sometimes we don't have full idea of what we're building. And fortunately, we have opportunity of greatly improving the robot over time. That's happening, you know, happening with Mercury where we rebuild a large portion of the structure, the feed, the, the electronics brand new as well, and uh, the sensing and so on. And it's happening now with Draco 3, um, a full humanoid that we've had for a while that we've learned to sort of improve over time and keep on evolving the hardware. And, and I think that's a, the model that we see if you're having humanoids in your lab is one of the models that I see for, uh, for, for keeping them alive for, you know, for hopefully four or five years if possible. So once you dominate, uh, this is a pure model-based strategy back in 2017. That was, um, um, you know, uh, after certainly Boston Dynamics and uh, and Agility and uh, uh, Oregon and and Michigan. It was one of the first ones uh, that could walk on these tiny uh, tiny feet. And and kudos to Don Kuhn over here, who was really the the force um, behind all of this, and eventually became faculty at um, uh, UMass uh, Amherst. Um, okay, so in this flavor of, uh, of model-based uh, controllers, another place where there is a great need, and this is newer work that we have with uh, companies like Dexterity in Silicon Valley. Um, some of you might know it because it's our good friend, uh, Samir Menon, who is the CEO, founder, and he's another you know force of nature. <laughs> and he's, he has built this one of the most successful uh, robotic companies in the US uh, for, for truck loading. This just appeared on the news recently. And uh, for them, we've been developing time optimal uh, path uh, parameterization and path planning in that um, it is an advantage to really place the boxes 
with these um with these uh, you know gains on um on these uh, you know milliseconds if you will right like if every box you put it like 100 milliseconds faster over an entire day an entire month and so on and so forth you really um you really are um are making a, a dent on on um, on the on the on the business and on the performance and uh, the recognition also that third order constraints jerk constraints are hugely important they are not important only for the smoothness of the trajectories but in the paper that we just submitted we found that it has up to 40 percent power efficiency uh results so just imagine uh, a bunch of these robots operating in 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 these factories and you know saving 40 percent power over over months and years is a huge amount of savings so you more of this work to come soon we're really excited um other flavored model based uh, control is on the exoskeleton world these are some of the visions that we had uh, a guidance and augmentation exoskeletons a few years ago uh, that's that's sort of a whole body controllers for exoskeletons as as a, a sort of um, um, a one norm uh, optimizers with prioritization. And uh, you can see here FC would be the calf forces sensing um, on the on the calves. And X, sorry, and G is a filter. Um, the rest is, is sort of a static analysis and multi-contact analysis and, uh, you know, um, uh, torque constraints and so on. Very similar. But uh, one important thing is that the filters, the, the G, is it got to be, um, let's go here, it has to be a function of frequency. These are achieved what we call uh, loop shaping uh, the capabilities. That's a, the G filter. You cannot just apply again and just you know crank it up to the maximum, right? So, and it cannot be just a low pass filter. It has to be something much more sophisticated. And not only that, it has to have knowledge of the human uh, body. And then in our case, here another instance of model base, okay? Um, for instance, uh, by taking data, and and that was I would say, is a is a model that has been obtained through the, through, through data extraction, through EMG data extraction, through um, through force data extraction, uh, but at the end of the day, is a model very simple. And then what we found out is that um, muscles are not uh, you know uh, linear uh, you know all these. They're actually these sort of um, uh, historical um, uh, behaviors. Uh, where the damping is a frequency of the um, imaginary term J, not S, which is the, the complex value, is basically frequency independent. And, and that we found correlations with the muscles and we found priors in the civil um, industry communities. And that has wonderful stabilization properties of the human muscle. And that responds to a lot of the invariance properties of the human body. So basically these controllers uh, could eventually replace uh, you know, simple PID controllers and imitate the human muscle, still staying simple. So if you uh, do all of that, that can take, you know, forms of, um, you know, lexicographic optimization, another type of model-based um, optimization, whole body control optimization. You can combine, you know, gravitational um, uh, compensation, uh, inertial compensation, force uh, calf compensation, and then all guidance compensation. That's what Whole body controllers are about right combining a lot of things in different dimensions and then you can accomplish uh things of this sort that we uh, we build well i'm trying to build this system uh with us and then we perform uh, uh, a lot of uh, control uh, tests over here all right so um we've seen a variety of uh, approaches that are heavy model base we're going to move a scale up and um, into Introducing a little bit of ML, uh, machine learning, in this case for dynamic modeling, which I think is in controls is one of the, the important areas. Um, uh, so, for instance, uh, suppose you want to um, do um, kind of multi contact behaviors, and uh, the one on the left, uh, yeah, uh, of this sort, right? And you want to do it with, 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 uh, with the knowledge of the, of the terrain maps, um, and, and you know, you want to do it as fast as possible. So. That, that requires you to have knowledge of inverse kinematics, right? Um, and uh, so, for instance, in the left side here, we see a centroidal model, which is widely used in um, in, a, in many types of robots, but in quadrupeds, making hypotheses that the inertia is constant is fine, but in humanoids, we have you know large, uh, large inertia uh, momenta induced by the heavy legs, and those, uh, we need to learn these inertials, right? And computing them with recursive dynamics. So that's what this is 
you know, ML to approximate uh, the dynamic, the inertial properties of the system, right? And um, there are clever tricks here on uh, restricting the, the space where you compute these inertias. And then, you know, finally you have a, a, a neural network approximation and that allows you to do much faster um, optimization. And that would be, we published a paper called Tower Plus. It was an extension of Tower by ETH. It was more uh, custom made for humanoids, right? And for quadrupeds, uh, where we accounted for this uh, time varying inertia and for this uh, inverse kinematic feasibility also as machine learning, uh, as, as neural network learn processes. And the rest is, is almost in touch from, um, Tower in the sense that we take into account the terrain and so on. So we, we see here a little bit of a combination of, uh, you know, uh, optimization, model-based optimization with a little, some tricks for approximating dynamics and kinematics with uh, machine learning. Uh, here we see another um, um, uh, case of, of hybrid ML um, uh, exploration. Uh, far on the right side, on the lower right side, we see a, a, a spot is searching frantically for the suitcase which is um, also on the bottom right on the left side. And it's doing this with frontier exploration, but it doesn't have an idea of the map. So rather than um, uh, you know, um, uh, doing, doing a slam, what it does is it has, has trained um, a model to recognize dynamic and static futures that correspond to, to, um, uh, to non-stationary items, things that are you know, like a chair, it's not really part of a building in my move, but the walls are part of the building. So really recognizing this difference and using that information as an information gain where the robot is spending more time where it thinks that it might be things more interesting, which corresponds to like short-term futures and dynamic futures, humans around. And here it you know, searches frantically everywhere and delete. This could be you know good for like inventory control, inventory supervision and, and this kind of task. Okay, finally found the... The, the suitcase. Okay, so the final part of my talk is we've seen, you know, only model base. We've seen um, a transition to whole body con you know, model based controllers with um, slight uh, brush uh, brushes of, of ML, and now um, moving towards more ML, but still keeping the um, the advantages of using uh, whole body controllers uh, for 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 what it does: tracking, stabilization, and so on. And here we've partnered with uh, um, RPL, uh, a lab run by Yuki Zhu, and uh, our lab on uh, something called Trill. Um, some of the previous work on uh, this is deep imitation learning, and this is really my favorite strategy right now for telling robots, telling humanoids what to do. Right, is the um, um, the space of possibilities and the fact that you have a stated space that is gigantic because you have all the camera information, you have all of the um, uh, tactile information is you know. Uh, um, model-based algorithms with these large state spaces, they, they collapse. So we have to reduce the dimensionality before we send it to a whole body controller. Obviously, mutational learning has been explored heavily in areas like um, uh, from mock-up uh, sets and, and retargeting to uh, walking to telemanipulation and so on. Our novelty here, and this is a paper that was just accepted in uh, Humanoids uh, 2023, um, is on um, on the use of for, 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 for full human robots, imitation learning for for legged manipulation, basically, and with the difficulty that you know you have free floating dynamics, you have multi contact, and 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 so on and so forth. And then what we came up is with a hybrid sort of ML and a model based strategy. On the right side, we have you know um, implicit hierarchical um, whole body control with a divergent component of motion planner. And then what we need to uh, learn is um, three or four things. We need to learn uh, when to grasp, basically when to open and close the gripper. That's not given to us. You need to learn the SE3 trajectories of the end effectors. And we need to learn the gate sequences and also the gate trigger. When do we start walking? So um, inputs on the left side, on the very left side of this graph, we have the, um, you know, the, the stereo images. We have to train you know, our image encoders, which is already a little bit difficult. We have poses joint states and the state machine of the controller. And then the, the three flavors of, um, um, of, uh, of logistic and, and trajectory approximation functions that we use, we use just plain logistics, uh, you know, uh, on off for grasping and for gate triggers. We use multi-level um, uh, logistic regression for gate types, you know, turning uh, uh, sidewise and so on. 
And then we use a mix of, ga of um, Gaussian models for encoding the trajectories. These trajectories are not just one, they are um, a sequence of them. So you need to learn the triggers of those trajectories and in the form of an RNN and, and, and some you know, architecture tricks here on the left side. So when you put everything together, uh, that's a, this movie is, a, is teleoperated. You, you need to obtain the data sets. That, that's just a fun movie that um, we put out some time ago um, on uh, students were really hungry when performing this, um, um, all of these tests. So uh, they were very really lazy also. So they decided the robot should cook ramen. Okay, that's the future kind of vision. This, this, all these movies is teleoperated, but it already tells you that through the operation, you can do quite uh, quite a bit. I want to move in the name of time uh, to the next slide. Uh, that's actually what's going on. Students are are uh, training. We're particularly interested in in dual uh, dual arm uh, dual arm tasks. Uh, the robot is standing up, so momentum conservation has to be taken into account. And then we take you know many uh, many data sets um, uh, the tests. In this case, here there are fifty, but we really run with two hundred fifty. Um, examples with some variability. That's another thing that we're working on, increasing uh, variability. And that's the end, uh, the end task here. The most interesting one is the one on the right side where we uh, hear autonomously from the learned behaviors. The robot is, is learning this sequence of trajectories, when to trigger them, is learning when to open and close the gripper and just perform the whole task as a, as a, as a deep imitation learning behavior, right? So that would be a, uh, so in this case, the decision making is made by the ML process. Whereas before in the previous slide, we saw that the decision making behaviors was done by the optimizer, the model based optimizer. So it's switch on who's doing the model based um, decision. Um, you know, more complex behaviors. I'm going to skip that in the name of time. Um, as I said at the beginning, everything for us is the employment of humanoids and so on for good, good stuff. We have this larger pro pro uh, problem uh, where we deploy humanoids and quadrupeds in our larger communities. This is a wider project at UT. Um, and from there emerges work also with RPL and HCRL. That, that, was, pre uh, that was preceding the work on um, imitation learning, uh, on the man telemanipulation. In this case, we're employing both imitation learning and reinforcement learning. Here, the right side is what shows really the result. If you think about it, we're taking all the RGBD uh, information, and uh, inertial information. And, you know, we are, you know, here we have a food. It's really hard to respond to the food but because, because we are transforming pixels to steering commands. Then we are able to really pick these, these subtleties of the environment and navigate in very crowded uh, environments. This was work published last year in ICRA, this year in ICRA. And I'm not going to go into detail here. We have a cart that uh, students kind of run around and collect um, dozens of hours of data. And finally, I think this is my last slide, almost my last slide, is that uh, teaming up with Nanchulu, we are using a variety of sensors, in particular EDA here on this, the second from left. These, these are electrodermal sensors. They take, they take sweat, uh, sweat glands. They open really quickly. And this is a measurement of stress. Of course, ECG, in this case, Nanchu builds these sensors and we use them with her. And uh, that gives us an idea of whether robots, you know, do we get stressed if there are humanoids around, there are, you know, dogs around and so on. That's a very important response, uh, question that we have to answer. My final slide is that we're organizing Humanoids 2023 in Austin. Um, we have a competition where we have uh, um, all of these humanoids competing in, um, in a kind of a social navigation. And then we've been really lucky that we have excellent sponsors. You know, we'll have a panel with Aptronic, Fourier Intelligence and One X. These are all the platinum sponsors. And then we have all of these other um, companies that will bring their robots. So we're looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. Uh, that was an uh, inspiring, great um, talk. And um, so I think it's time for... Um, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Um, we have a panel at the end, so we are going to have Luis, you know, joining our panel. But if you have quick questions about his presentations, please go ahead. Um, so I'm just waiting for Tian Wei uh, if there are any questions from the audience. If there are any questions, please come here. Um, any questions? A quick question, maybe come. 
Yeah. You, yeah, please come. Use this mic, yeah. Yeah, come here. Can you hear us, Emil? Yes. Okay, go ahead, uh, Professor. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, please. Okay, thanks. Thanks for a great talk. So just a quick question is, uh, I have been seeing like many robots recently start to use small feet. So like uh, you can see robots with like line feet or even point feet. So I just wonder what's the, so aside from that you cannot use DMP for those kind of locomotions, what's the consensus of like, maybe those kind of feet will help with the dynamics or is there any benefit to specifically do that? So having a small fit, you mean? Okay, thanks. Yeah, so um, I, I, this is a, a question uh, is very important is in fluctuation. Um, I, I would say first from an aesthetic standpoint, robots with a small feet look look cool. <laughs> um, and uh, they they show the progress on, on balance. Um, I would argue that probably also they use smaller torques on the ankles because the moment the, the 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 uh, sorry the 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 momentum uh, angular momentum is is uh, is lower uh, moment uh, moment is lower, and um and then maybe also response to another thing of what what is the advantage of humanoids with respect to quadrupeds is their form factor right that they they have kind of a vertical form factor they um, they have a, a very low footprint so you're reducing the footprint this means that. These robots can potentially go and go, you know, behind a sofa and clean and places where um, where they can they can also move the they can move away, uh, you know, very fast by just stepping, and so on and so forth. The control uh, of uh, wide feet and uh, large feet and small feet is is uh, is different. Uh, ZMP uh, and DCM controllers and so on are um, often employed in in large feet. And uh, in a small feed, uh, you really require to have very good estimation, very perfected control end to end. So small feed robots, they tend to be controlled with more variations of raver controllers. So a lot of the, what you see, I, 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 you know, what you see in uh, places like Aptronic and uh, um, I, uh, I believe that, um, you know, uh, it, 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 a lot of them are, are sort of raver variations or they are, you know, hybrid dynamics. Uh, from uh, you know Oregon and other places, Michigan, those are more adequate for small feed, whereas bigger feed is uh, we see more success with ECM. Right, thank you. Welcome. Any other question? Any more questions? Please, please come here. One more question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi, Dr. Sanders. Thank you for the great presentation. I have a more, can you, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I have a more um, of a general question. So um, I've noticed that all the commercial products and many of the uh, biped uh, prototypes are more of uh, rigid articulated systems and uh, I'd like to know your perspectives about uh, physical compliance uh, embodied in the truck or sort of thing. Do you think it's a, a possible future direction for research and or it's more of like a, a current zone thing for control and estimation? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think rather than thinking about soft um, robots and things of this sort. I, I think more about lightweightness. There is a push for having lighter and lighter robots and also, you know, rapid prototyping and um and uh, and other fabrication techniques. And that 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 forces the um, structures, uh, even the gears could you know, ultimately become, you know, um uh, uh you know onyx and other type of materials. And um, and then you have to deal now with the, the compliance of the of the structure. So um, that poses really difficult questions on control. Um, 
And uh, in particular, we are relying, over relying on feedback gains. Um, non, I don't think necessarily we need to have better feed forward. I think, um, and then you know, certainly, and the feed forward that we have, it needs to be augmented with things like Gaussian processes or things of this sort that are able to model these flexible materials. Um, but um, also the type of controllers, the feedback controllers, for instance, mimicking the human muscle behaves in a very robust uh, way to the variability of, um, of uh, body anatomy and physiology that could have huge uh, advantages. So we have to look at different paradigms in, in my view. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, Emil, please continue. Yes, um, I have a quick question. Uh, feel free to, you know, we can continue in the panel. Um, from biomechanics perspective, uh, for your, you know, future, uh, for the future humanoids that you will be uh, developing. So how do you see, um, how would you see the biomechanics field help your research? Well, I, I think I, uh, I I said a little bit just just now. I I, I you know ML and I we come from the same lab. I, I'm hugely inspired and motivated by uh, the, the human behavior, um, and I, I I think at the at the biomechanic level or at the physiology level, um, you know I'm really interested in the in the muscle behavior and and the properties that it has, and and developing new types of feedback controllers that because the you know this this sort of um, you know PID controllers and um, and uh, and you know and uh, uh, optimal controllers um, um, you know MPC using um, classical methods they don't really behave as a human muscles but they can be extended with some of these um, uh, robustness properties of a human muscle and that's what I'm interested I think it will improve significantly to copy the human muscle performance I, there is other questions of the you know actuation structures and so on uh that's not something i'm actively working uh on uh, you know um motivated by tendons and so on uh, my my experience in the past is that it has been extremely difficult to achieve high bandwidth with soft tendons and so on serious elastic actuators you need to have very special type of control to have good position control and that's desirable to work well, but it's possible. So maybe we're going to see a combination of clever, you know, full state feedback with bio-inspired materials in the future. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, I think we, um, so we are going to stop here and uh, we are happy to have uh, Luis joining us for the panel. Um, so let's give him another round of applause for the great talk.